Hello everyone, welcome to the final video of the AS Biology syllabus. For the final time, I am Dr. Demi and in this video, I will take you through autoimmune diseases as well as take you through monoclonal antibodies. This is the section that ends the AS Biology syllabus, which is uh, chapter 11. So if you're trying to just revise for your exams, uh, please have a look at this video. It would be very helpful to you. Um, I use notes from my classroom, just saying this for the last Last time so if you want to take down some notes or have some more comprehension with notes then you're welcome to use um, some of my notes so the first question is what is an autoimmune disease an autoimmune disease is a disease that happens when the immune system attacks the cells of the body in other words the immune system does not only attack foreign cells but it also attacks cells that belong to the body which then results in conditions that are very difficult to manage for example you might have muscular dystrophy um, it is an autoimmune disease and these here are just examples of the different types that you might find and you would see if you've read anything about these different conditions that they have a tendency to be debilitating simply because it's the body that's attacking itself and we're going to get into some detail as to why that happens so when your body makes your T cells uh, in the thymus, some of those cells will come out with receptors that fit onto the cell surface antigens of your own cells. These T cells are usually damaged or rather destroyed as soon as they are produced because the problem with this is that if the T cell receptors fit with your own cells, it means that those T cells will recognize your cells as antigens and they will stimulate an immune response against it. So so these cells are usually destroyed, but sometimes some of them are able to escape. And when they escape, they then become activated and stimulate an immune response that then attacks certain cells within the body. In some people, the immune attack is localized to a certain organ, which means it's just in a certain part of the body. For example, in people who have rheumatoid arthritis, you would find that many people tend to have it around their legs, but some people also have it around their hands. Um, it all depends on where where these T cells are attacking um, the body's cells. In others, it can be carried out against the whole body. And that obviously can be very, very um, debilitating for such a person. An example of an autoimmune condition is myasthenia gravis. Uh, this is a condition that you have to know according to your syllabus. It is an autoimmune disease that attacks the neuromuscular junctions between the nerve cells and the skeletal muscles, um, especially um, around the eyes. So you usually see that people who have myasthenia gravis will have um, a droopy eye um, in, some, in some instances, or they would have both eyes um, looking droopy. This is simply a result of the cells being attacked by the immune system and so unable to transmit um, information as they should. Now, if you um, haven't read anything about the nervous system, when you get to your A-level syllabus, that's something that you will do. I believe it's chapter 15, which is coordination. Uh, but before you get there, I'll just explain this in a little bit. Now, when your nerve cells um, receive information, they transmit that information to your muscle cells. So say, for example, you're standing outside in the sun, you're looking up, and all of a sudden, you see a huge rock coming down towards you. The, what receives the information are your optic nerves. So your eyes look up and they can see something is coming. And then they send a message to your brain that says, okay, there's a rock coming towards him or her. So that means that this person needs to run. Your brain then sends a message down to your muscle cells, um, which would include the muscles in your legs and your legs start to run off. And as a result of that, you're able to prevent yourself from being hit by a rock from the sky, which is highly unlikely, but listen, anything is possible. But now, in the case of people who have myasthenia gravis, um, there is a problem here. So the way the transmission works, and I'm just going to explain it using this image here on the left. The way the transmission works is that the nerve cell would send the message and that message is transmitted through what we call a neurotransmitter. The neurotransmitter is acetylcholine. Acetylcholine will go and bind to receptors on the muscle cell and as a result of that, take the message from the nerve cell to the muscle cell. So again, 
the nerve cell gets the message it transmits it all the way down the message is carried in these little vesicles these are all vesicles over here the vesicles contain acetylcholine and so acetylcholine is then released into the cleft between the nerve cell and the muscle cell acetylcholine will then bind to the receptors on the muscle cell and as a result the muscle cell gets the message and it responds um, to whatever it is the impulse is now when people have myasthenia gravis it's a very different story their helper T cells uh, produce B cells that then produce antibodies also let's just say that their B cells produce antibodies that are specific to the acetylcholine receptors which means that these antibodies will go and sit where the receptors are they sit on top of the receptors and as a result of that when the acetylcholine is taking the message from the nerve cell it is unable to bind to the receptor because the B cell antibodies are now sitting on the receptors so think of it this way this is a receptor on the muscle cell normally acetylcholine would be able to bind here so let's say this is a molecule of acetylcholine now instead of acetylcholine being able to bind there is an antibody that has been secreted that is now sitting on the receptor on the nerve cell what that means is that acetylcholine would not be able to bind right and so in that re in that way the the signal or the impulse would not be transmitted um, to the muscle cells now what what that happens is that the muscle fibers will destroy this antibody complex because simply what the muscle fibers recognize is that wait a minute something is wrong here the receptors are not working as they should so they destroy the receptor antibody complex now when they destroy that receptor antibody complex they don't grow new receptors this then means that there are no receptors for the muscles to then receive signals from the nerves and as a result of that the muscle tissue will start to break down that is why in myasthenia gravis you're very likely to see that such people have um, droopy eyes simply because the muscle tissue is breaking down so that is all you need to know about uh, autoimmune diseases uh, myasthenia gravis is the focus but if that changes with the future syllabus uh, please make sure that you find information on whatever the new condition is and also remember that you need to know how myasthenia gravis is caused and that is the fact that the b cells of the body make antibodies that sit or that block the receptors on the muscle cells and as a result of that the, the nerve cells are unable to transmit transmit impulses to the muscle cells and once the muscle cells do not receive these impulses simply because the antibodies are blocking their receptors um, they break down the antibody receptor complex that means there are no receptors on the muscle fiber it is unable to receive any signals and as a result of that the muscle starts to break down so think of it as if you don't use it you lose it if the muscle is not getting any fibers um, any impulses rather or signals then it starts to break down and that is simply what myasthenia gravis is about also remember to mention acetylcholine when you discuss myasthenia gravis that said we will now look at antibodies monoclonal antibodies uh, monoclonal antibodies is the very last section of the AS biology syllabus so I am very excited that you have made it thus far monoclonal antibodies are simply identical clones or identical um, antibodies of the same type of B cell and so Sometimes it is very difficult because B cells do not tend to produce a lot of antibodies. The ones that produce antibodies do not divide by mitosis and so it is hard to get large numbers of them. The B cells that divide by mitosis do not produce antibodies. I hope that's not confusing. If it is, again, just post a comment in the, um, post the question in the chat or in the comment section rather and I will get back to you. Now, in order to make sure that we can make a lot of the same antibodies the solution was to create what we call the hybridomas and a hybridoma is simply a fusion of an antibody producing cell and a cancer cell and many students usually look at me open mouth when I say this because they say wait what we use cancer um, in in the production of antibodies and the answer is that yes we do do that um, cancer cells have proven very helpful in creating large numbers of monoclonal antibodies you <laughs>
So how do we create a monoclonal antibody? The first thing we do is we take the antigen, right? We put the antigen and we inject it into a mouse. The mouse then produce, um, produces plasma cells over here. So I'm just going to use a pen so that you're able to follow. Um, there was an error. Um, so the mouse then produces plasma cells that produce a lot of um, antibodies to against this antigen. So let's assume that this is an antigen for... Um, let's say the, the common cold, right? So this is the common cold. We've injected it into a mouse. The mouse, the, the immune system of the mouse would respond by producing a lot of um, plasma cells that then produce antibodies. We then take those antibodies or those cells, the plasma cells rather, and fuse it with a tumor cell. The reason why the tumor cell is important here is that if you remember with cancer, cancer has a tendency of uncontrolled division. As a matter of fact, cancer is uncontrolled cell division. So that means that by fusing the antibody with this tumor cell, we've created a hybrid domer that will start to divide uncontrollably. And as a result of that, give us endless supply of the exact same type of antibody. So this is one of the advantages of a cancer cell, I guess. Uh, but um, in other regards, it is a condition that can be very debilitating. Now, we can use monoclonal antibodies either in diagnosis or we can use them in treatment. So an example of diagnosis is when a person has deep vein thrombosis. Deep vein thrombosis simply means there is a blood clot um, inside one of the person's deep veins. And usually people tend to have deep vein thrombosis in their legs. Um, that is why this image is over here where you can see um, that some people can get blood clots in their legs. In this case, in order to diagnose if a person person has deep vein thrombosis because it can be very hard trying to like scan through this and obviously you can't go and cut a vein open and say oh well let me just look for the vein um, for the clot and pull it out you have to be able to use a smarter technique and in this case monoclonal antibodies really help with that so what happens in this case is that antibodies um the antigen rather um, is, is injected into a mouse. So the antigen in this case is the um, protein called fibrin. It's the human fibrin protein. It's the main protein in the blood clot. And so fibrin is injected into a mouse and the mouse would then produce antibodies against fibrin. The mouse would make many of these plasma cells that produce these antibodies. They are then fused with cancer cells to make the hybridomas. The hybridomas can then be radioactively labeled. And by radioactively labeling, them, it is easy to then follow them because they would radiate a signal or radiate a signal as they travel through the body. They are then injected into the patient and the hybridomas will immediately go to where the fibrin is located. And as a result of that, as a doctor, you're then able to see with a good scan that, okay, this is where the blood clot is and you're able to help the patient better. So this is one of the ways in which antibodies, uh, monoclonal antibodies rather, have been used used in diagnosis. Also note that monoclonal antibodies are sometimes written as MABs in textbooks, uh, but that doesn't mean that you should write them as MABs in the exams because you might be penalized for that. Monoclonal antibodies are also used in treatment. However, there are many issues when we try to use them in treatment because you need to apply them more than once. Um, in some cases, there are many problems with treatment in the sense that when you use the um, antibodies from like a mouse or from a rabbit or whatever other laboratory animal you're using, sometimes you might have um, an immune response when you try to use them to treat a person because that means that the person's cell will recognize these antibodies as foreign and start to attack them. So the way these problems have been addressed is that the genes that code for the heavy and light chains of the antibodies have been humanized by altering them, which means that they now code for human heavy and light chains. And as a result of that, when they get into the body, the body recognizes them as human and does not attack them. Also just changing the arrangement of the sugar groups so that they are similar to human ones and do not 
just simply remain rat or mice or rabbit, whatever it is, um, that also helps to address the issue. Some of the MABs, uh, monoclonal antibodies that is, that have been used in treatments include Herceptine uh, for breast cancers, Epilimum Lab uh, for melanoma, which is a type of skin cancer, and Infliximab for rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, these are just some examples. You can always have a look at them if you want to read some more information. So that brings me to the end of the AS Biology Syllabus. I hope you have enjoyed watching these videos, using them for revision. I hope they have been helpful to you in terms of like just getting comprehensive notes or even just like reading and understanding again um, with a different set of slides from what you might have used in the classroom. I hope they help you revise for your exams. I'm very delighted I was able to start this project and complete it because when I started, I thought to myself, oh my goodness, how on earth am I going to record 11 chapters of biology, which everyone knows is a very content heavy subject, but I'm glad I've been able to finish it. Um, if you found them very helpful, by all means, please leave a comment to just let me know how they've helped you. Um, if you feel like they could have been done better or there's information that you would like to share, uh, please share that in the comment section and I'm sure people would appreciate interacting with comments and also just sharing knowledge with each other. Thank you so much for coming on this AS Biology journey with me. I hope you have a good exam and I wish you success in your endeavors. Have a good time for the last time. Goodbye.